Welcome to Hanging with the Hammer. Welcome to Hanging with the Hammer. Um, this is uh, another show, another Saturday. Um, remember your questions make the show. If I don't have questions, I don't have much of a show, as you all know, unless I have a guest. Uh, this week, I don't have any planned guests. Um, but if those of you that have been on my show before want to try the old uh, uh, link to see if it gets you in, I, I'd love to know if that ever worked. But I didn't send out any links today, so today is going to be me and you and your questions. I always appreciate your questions. Uh, last week we did Ask Girl Anything, and that's my new place I'm going to put Ask Girl Anything is going to be on weeks I will not be doing Hanging with the Hammer. So one of the things I hit last week was a place where I realized I really needed a week to kind of regroup and get my stuff together. So that's what I, I did last weekend. I tried to regroup, get some things together, take it a little bit more easy. I didn't do as many covers. Um, I spent some time thinking about a lot of things um, and life and stuff. So every once in a while, I'm going to need a weekend like that. Um, this is Memorial Day weekend, so I've got some extra space. I'll probably make some more covers this weekend than I normally do. But um, the following week, I'm not sure if I'm going to do an Ask Earl anything or if I'm going to do a Hanging with the Hammer, just to be honest with you all. Um, and the reason for that is I'm supposed to be going to Fort Myers to see my mother-in-law, so that might mean we leave late or we leave early. If I leave late, then um, we will uh, do the show. <clears throat> do the show. Sorry about that. Excuse me so much. Need to take a little bit of water today. I see I'm talking to one person, so... Anyhow, if you are out there, feel free to identify yourself. I'm going to make sure the comments are on so I know if somebody's out there. Uh, again, your comments make the show. Um, could possibly having one week off mean the show is off to everybody, or maybe you didn't see the announcements. I don't know. I'm not sure. I will go as long as I have questions today. That's the goal. But I will talk a little bit to a few things that are in my mind and on my heart today. And, um, of course I want to take drumming questions cause that's what I talk about mostly is drumming. But, um, I noticed, I've been noticing a few things this week. Um, I noticed a lot of new friends this last year, a lot, a new community of people have grown up. I've tried to highlight some of them, the new community on the show. So, um, we've had people like Chadwick Perry and Tate Berkey and those two guys are going to find their, their audiences any way we look at it. They, they great, create great content and are great musicians. And then I've got guys like Eric at the, um, the Drum Attic, who's a friend. Um, he's creating content. I'm trying to help him get out there. I'm not saying he's not a great musician, but, you know, there are guys like Chadwick that have been playing years and years and years pro, and Tate's really got some serious chops. So I'm really impressed by Tate, to be honest. His Chicago stuff really does impress me. Um, but there are guys like I'm trying to help grow your channel. Uh, I think there's a lot of room in the community in YouTube for us. But it's a strange community right now, and it's a strange YouTube world right now. Um, there's a lot more drummers, a lot of young ones coming up. That's really cool, and that's what you want to see them do. But I want to say something about being noticed and playing in this YouTube world. First off... Don't get your self-worth from people's reaction to your videos. I mean, I appreciate everybody's nice reactions to my videos and my playing. And every once in a while, I get somebody who doesn't like my playing, and that's fine and dandy, you know. I try to live by this the golden rule, which is basically be kind to others and treat others how you'd like to be treated. So my YouTube persona is to be that. And if I don't like something, I'll probably say nothing. And I won't thumbs down anybody. I, I rarely thumbs up people, to be honest. I'm not a big thumbs up person. And I know like and subscribe gets you into the uh, um, gets you into the feed a little faster. But like and subscribe doesn't necessarily mean what I want to push. So um, anyhow, with that said, you know, don't allow anybody to make you feel bad about not doing enough, don't have enough covers out, can't make, make your 
your your deadlines that you've created for yourself. Um, there's no perfect formula to YouTube. I have no formula to YouTube right now. I'm just putting out content because I put a, make a lot of content. And maybe I've oversaturated it. Maybe that's why I have one person out there. <laughs> hey, Tate, good morning. I said something nice about you. I hope you heard that. Um, thanks for being here today. It's you and me and a dog named Boo right now. So, um, but with that said, like I was saying before, I really believe that this YouTube persona thing is a little, little out there. You got to do this because you love it. You got to do it because you want to do it and you want to have fun with it. And if you're not having fun with it, then why are we doing it anyhow? That's, that's the way I look at life. So I have time on my hands. Growing children gives you time. And with that time, I am spend my weekends playing. So, hey, great to have some new people up here. Walton's on today. Sure. Doi. Drama. I never say that right. But, Walton, to have you on on a Saturday, that's awesome. It's 10.30 p.m. on Saturday night in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you'll be on for a couple minutes before you go to bed there on me. Um, Walton and I have been friends for since I started on YouTube. I think we both had about 20 or 30 subscribers when we started on this thing. And somehow I found his videos. He makes very cool videos with a kind of a Spanish flavor. He, he finds like Latin type stuff. He has a real affinity to that music and that place, Spain, from what I've seen in some of his travel videos and stuff so check out his videos they're not your normal standard pop covers so they're it's a little different you got a little different thing going on there um good morning Lori jones from the uk um it's always great to see some friends on here and thanks for the hang you know your questions make the show so if you have any questions or any thoughts you want to throw in we can keep going but my discussion point today is youtube and not getting trapped in the youtube bubble of feeling the pressure to be something that you think everybody wants to grow your channel. Um, one of the things I've learned is I, focusing on growing your channel will not grow your channel. What grows your channel is just you being there and you get lucky. I, I think part of it is luck. I've got a couple videos that people have found that have been just perpetuating. Uh, one of them is Down Under, by the way, <laughs> Walton. I did, um, uh, uh, what, what's the band called? The song, the song Down Under, you know, dum dum da da dum da 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 I'm trying to think of the name of the band now. Band, da 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 Somebody can throw the name of that band out. But I did that, I did a cover of that, just me playing all kinds of junk over it. And it's got 10, 11, 12,000. I don't know, last time I looked at it, it was like ridiculous. People watch that video. And I think it's because I'm just playing what I wanted to play, which is kind of funny. Men at work. Thank you, Tate. I'm from the 80s. I should know men at work. But I did. I totally out there, man. Good morning, CCM drummer. Matthew, nice to have you today. But, yeah, men at work, that's, that's the one, man. And people love that cover. I don't know why. They just they think it's fun. They think it's a fun song. And. Um, whenever I heard that song on MTV, I remember listening to it. I always thought it needed all these fills in it. And that's the way I played it that day. I just kind of just played it the way I thought about it. And I had the big kit, so it made it more interesting that day. Um, I was actually playing Sabian cymbals that day, for those of you that are gearheads and like that kind of stuff. But finding, you know, finding your niche and playing something, then the feed finds itself and people find you. So, um, but, um... Yeah, thanks for, thanks for being on, Walton. Man, totally appreciate you being here. Um, but anyhow, so don't get sucked into the whole trying to live it up. I saw a young one of the young guys, you know, making a, a video saying, I, I promise to post once a week, but I'm not going to make it this week. Um, I think it was Ben and Michael drumming. And nice, ni nice guy, seems like. He's been following some of my videos. And I just wrote to him, said, Ann, don't feel like you have to do this every week. Don't let that pressure get on you. Um, things will grow in due time. People will figure that out. Do what you do for fun. Have fun with it. Lori Jones says, as an older drummer, retired from my day job. Let me see if I can put you in the feed. There we go. Uh, I enjoy watching and listening to good music and musicians. Well, thank you, Lori. Uh, Definitely, that's what I do on YouTube too. I I love um, hanging out with 
and watching great musicians too. That's why that's where I found it. I found YouTube was the place to find music because television had no music. I mean, MTV stopped being viable a long time ago, and VH1 and I used to watch CMT. I used to have those channels, and now I've said, why do I need those channels? I can't watch anything that I really want to see anymore. So YouTube's the only place to really watch live music. Welcome, Spiro Drums. Thank you for being on, man. I appreciate you being on. Um, so let's see. Anybody have a question? Let's see. Lori Jones said, oh, by the way, live music allowed here in Wales from today. My daughter has her first gig. Well, that's great. Yeah, music is opening up in the world again. That's that's pretty cool. Um, in my part of the world, um, if you've been vaccinated, you can not wear a mask. That's what we're told. If you've been vac- not been vaccinated, if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. If you've not been vaccinated, you're supposed to wear a mask. So that, that, that'll be interesting to see how they regulate that one. Um, I work for a company. I'm a safety guy, so um, I've been part of the policy discussions for that, how we're going to deal with that in our company. But, yeah, the music is opening up. I saw Tate was playing a gig last weekend. Um, so that's cool. And I've been playing in church the whole coronavirus pretty much. There's just been a very small number of people in church. And, um, so that's my week, that's my bi-weekly gig pretty much. Every two weeks I play. This was supposed to be a week to play, but this week we're having our first family dinner meeting on a Sunday. So we're not, I'm not playing. So I don't have to play this week. Let's see what Tate said. Tate said, not sure if it's in your plans to talk about, but would love to hear your opinions about the ongoing. Oh gosh. You want to hear that? Hey, I just posted some more on that about the. Uh, Warner Music Group saga on Instagram. Any plans to change what you're doing on Instagram because of it? Mm. Well, let's talk about Warner Music Group. They're, the funny thing is they're targeting really old videos of mine. Um, I, I had about 10 videos blocked yesterday. Now, what I do on Instagram, which is different than YouTube, is I rarely contest things on YouTube. If YouTube's not going to let me get it, it's... I have way more invested in YouTube. So YouTube has become a place where I have subscribers. I have monetized content. So like this is a monetizable show. Um, you get some ads and I make a few dollars on it every four months or so. I make $100. So yay, yay, yay. I'm getting rich on, on Google, you know. But it, it is something I've invested time in and I've built this channel. Instagram is more of a game for me. I mean, I, it's a place for me to throw my, my videos, and I, I enjoy it. I've, I've now developed over three, four years of doing this. I finally have some people I love watching, like George Flutus, Tate, um, some of the pro drummers. So Instagram's good for that. But on the other side of it is I still am not getting a lot of content views. So the funny thing is WMG is taking down videos that nobody watches which cracks me up. Like today I had a Christmas video taken down. I think it had like uh, 19 views on it. They blocked it originally during Christmas season. And I already posted three more, so nobody went backwards. Rarely do people go backwards on your videos unless they like what you did. So on Instagram, it's not like YouTube you search. It's like that you find somebody, you lock on, and you say, hey, let's see what else he did, and then you click. And every once in a while I'll see somebody watch like five or six videos on on Instagram, but they don't normally go all the way back two years to go find something. So today I lost uh, an Eagles tune. I lost a Christmas video where I was playing brushes. It was from the Charlie Brown's Christmas stuff. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, why is it WMG wasting their time on me? Apparently they're wasting their time on everybody right now. So it doesn't really matter who you are. There's the bots are out and they're just beating the heck out of us. So I am thinking about how can I change my content around to not get blocked. And that would mean basically doing some uh, take the drum track out mixes or mixing the track way down just for Instagram. And that's more work than it's worth to me because I do seven videos on a weekend and I don't really want to mess with the audio again. Once I do it, I do it. And once I'm done with it, I throw it away. I mean, I don't keep any of these sessions more than a week or two that's it so usually my logic files i clean out periodically once i get a final cut draft of my video and i'm happy with it and i post it on youtube i throw that 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 session file away 
Otherwise, I would have hard drives of space. I'd have 20, 30 gigabytes of, of video files out there, and I just can't do that. So, um, yeah, that that's that's one that I'm thinking about. Tate says, I, for one, might stop putting cover teasers on Instagram. Well, that's a possibility. You know, that's, that's something you got to think about. Um, I'm going to keep trying. My covers, most of them are getting through right now, Tate, so... Um, they're getting through for a minute and then they get blocked. <laughs> so I'm going to see how long I can get away with it, but it may get to the point where they push us off and all we get is the, the guys just showing trop chops. That's all they want to show us. Michael Perry. Hi, Michael Perry. Nice to have you today. Um, Michael Perry, I'll ask you this question. I'm going to be doing an, um, and ask Earl anything soon, and I was going to answer your question there, but if you want, I can answer that question today. So you let me know. I won't jump into it unless you ask me to jump into that question. Um, but, uh, yeah, WMG Universal Music Group is on fire on Facebook for some reason. I don't know why. I have no understanding why they think they need to do that, but they are. So, uh, all right. Michael Perry says, sure to the question. So let me, Michael, you jump in if I got this wrong, but you wanted to know, and I believe, let me see if I can, I'm going to find the question. See, I have this iPad here, and I know where the question is, so let me find it. It's in my um, folders of stuff. Let's see if that's it. Um, Yes, okay. Um, Because you pointed out that I missed it, and you were correct about that. So let's see. Um... Do, 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 do. Let's find the question. Thanks for writing. I'm going to have S for Grace. Da, da, da. Let's see. Sorry I missed your question this week. Oh. Of course, the question's not on there. I believe the question had to do with um, my career. Do I have regrets in my career? That was the question. So the question was, do I have any regrets not going for the music career and choosing family and home and working in the real world and making a living that way? So, and I'll get back to your question, Lori, in a minute. So that was the question. So Michael asked me, do I have any regrets? I'm 60 years old. Do I have any regrets not going down the path of trying to make it as a, um, trying to make it as a professional musician? Because there was a point in time when I was, got out of college, I thought that's the road I was going to go on. But I'll tell you my story. Here's my story. I was in my senior year of college, and I was at this small little church, And my future wife, um, what happened was her husband left her, and she had a three-year-old daughter. And I always had, I don't know, I had this thing with her. We connected personally, we connected emotionally in some ways, connected spiritually. And when this happened, I just showed up and ended up being there. And I was a couple years younger than her, and I was still in college So I'm in my senior year of college, I'm trying to get out, I'm trying to find my way to the music business, and it got derailed, because I fell in love, and you fall in love with somebody, then changes things. Now the one thing she never did to me, and she, matter of fact, I've told this story many times, is my wife has done nothing but support my career. So from a musician standpoint, if you're going to find a woman in your life, you don't want one that's going to change you and say you can't be who you are. Matter of fact, once we got married and my son came along, which was 11 months after we got married, um, my son was born. I had two kids, and I'm thinking, it was right before I had the second kid, actually, right before Matt was born. Basically, what happened was I thought, I, I got to get another job. How am I going to pay this? How am I going to pay for being a husband and, and take care of my family and be responsible? So I'm thinking about getting a second job working at a gas station. And she goes, no, don't do that. Stay in what you're doing, the, you know, the one that gets you the medical, which was the cable television job, climbing poles, and you know, look for some gigs. And she talked to her mom, and her mom knew a guy that she used to go dancing out. And basically this guy had a band. And my mother-in-law basically talked to this guy, and he was the drummer. He was the owner of the band. His name was Ronnie Scavron. And Ronnie basically said, well, come on down to a gig and I'll let him sit in and see if I can get him some work. And I went down and I sat in with his band and I played a couple tunes 
and played a ballad, played a disco tune. I think I played YMCA and uh, What I Did for Love from A Chorus Line. And I remember it kind of that night. It was in a w, <laughs> VFW hall. And he said, you're a good drummer. I, I can get you a gig. And a week later, he found me a gig. And I was playing weekends. I was doing about 40, 50 dates with this band a year on the weekends and doing my cable job. And then Matt was born. And that was the beginning of it. And then I did that for a couple, three years. And then my wife said, um, after Matt was born, she was like, you know, I'd really like to go out and play with you too. Cause she was the worship leader at the church and she always wanted to sing. So like I, like I like to say, Lucy wanted to be in the show. So I said, okay, let's find a way to do that. And we built a band and we called the band. The original band was called celebration, but there was another celebration around and we ended up, uh, calling the, the next iteration of the band radiance. And we had that band for about six, seven years officially. And then the band kind of broke and then a new band. And then I started doing freelance gigs, a lot more freelance gigs with her. And I would occasionally do freelance gigs with other bands. So I was always doing freelance gigs during that period of time, though. So my career was an in-town career, but I couldn't get that break to going pro. But the funny thing was, when I was 27, I got in this band, this Christian band, and we went to Nashville and did a record. And that was another breaking point where I thought, well, maybe I'm going to go pro here. And that didn't happen. Um, what happened was I basically did the record, and we tried to go on tour. We did a couple small tours. We did one in Washington State, which was ridiculous. <laughs> and then we some did a lot of local gigs. And the record didn't take off. And basically, I said to myself, well, this isn't happening. And one day, I felt I didn't belong there. And I, I quit that band. And my wife was writing for magazines at this time. See, what happened was she loved me being in music so much, and she loved my career so much. She basically was a journalist. She would write for local newspapers. She queried Modern Drummer and ended up started writing magazine articles for Modern Drummer. And she wrote the first Christian Drummer's article in Modern Drummer in 87. It was a two-part series. And then we eventually interviewed Greg Morrow, who played with Amy Grant. And um, she, did, she did the first, um, what's his name, um, the jazz drummer, John Riley's first portraits in Modern Drummer. I went to the Village Vanguard, and we, he was playing with the Mel Lewis big band at the time which Mel had just passed away when we, she interviewed him and sat with John Riley. And then we did, uh, she did Tony Morales of the Rippington. So she was doing all that, but she did that because she wanted to learn drums to the point where she could talk drums with me. And she's as good about talking about drums as anybody else I know. And that was part of her desire to keep us close connected. So at 30, when I had my first real crisis of like, what do I do? Um, my job changed and at 29, my job changed 29, 30. And, um, I had an opportunity to get into training and safety and I realized going to be the big rock star wasn't going to happen. Plus I didn't have the look. I mean, I'm too big. I'm not thin. I didn't have the hair. You know, I could have had the hair, but I didn't have the hair, you know, and it just didn't happen, but I've done everything I ever wanted to do. I've played on big stages and those couple bands I was in during the late 80s, early 90s, um, I played on some big festivals. I pl played a Creation Festival in 1990. I played some big stages for some other music festivals in the Christian music industry. I recorded in Nashville and in, in New York City. Um, and I started recording locally in New Jersey. And then I decided to do my wife's album. And that's why I built a recording studio. And building the recording studio, that whole process has got me to where I'm at today. You know, doing drum covers because I've been doing recording for people for 21, 22 years now. And I've recorded about 14 albums for people um, that have been done at this studio pretty much. And I've recorded on those albums, a lot of them, not all of them. And I've had a great career in music, but I don't have the limelight, you know, and I don't miss the touring. And my day job took me on the road. And being on the road, I learned how lonely the road is, and I, I don't want to be on the road by myself. And the last year and a half, almost two years of coronavirus now, a year and a half of coronavirus, sleeping in my bed every night has been the greatest thing in my life. 
I love sleeping in my own bed. You know, I, I have 800 nights, over 800 nights in Marriott hotels, um, platinum lifetime, whatever the heck that means. And I don't care. I don't, I don't care if I ever sleep in another Marriott hotel, to be honest. But that's, that's what it's all about. So anyhow, your questions make the show. That was a long story. Hopefully that answered your question, Michael. I did not miss anything. I missed absolutely nothing in life. Life for me has been nothing but wonderful. And I wouldn't give it up for the world that I've had. So I am blessed. Um, you're welcome. Anybody else got any questions you guys want to talk about today? Your questions make the show. Remember that. So I'm trying to see if I missed anything. I didn't, did not. So thankful for all those of you that show up um, on these shows. Hi, drum covers by Bill. Thank you for dropping in and your amening of that. That was wonderful. Um, so what other topics would, would you guys like to talk about today? Let's um, think about it. Um, let me tell you about some, let me see. Along the lines of drum covers and other things like that, and the YouTube world. Um, I said this in the beginning a little bit, but, um, and because Michael Perry is on the show, he's kind of challenged me this last year. Or so are you, are you out of control or oh, what's the problem? So um, uh, I have been seemingly out of control doing all the covers I do. Let's see what um, Walton has to say here. Let's see. Hey Earl, I got about 50 covers on my channel, all hit Hispanic origin, never been blocked. I reckon WMG don't have bots that can understand Spanish. You are probably correct about that. Maybe that's the key to this whole thing is to do Spanish covers. That might be the way I have to go. Of course, I don't have that down yet, so I'd have to do a lot more work. But it's time to work on my Latin stuff. Maybe that's where I need to go with this. Um, all right, so let's see what Lori's got a question. Lori Jones, have you sold any gear and then regretted it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Now, that's a great question right there. All right, yeah, I've sold a lot of gear and a lot that I regret selling, wishing I hadn't sold it, to be honest. Um, let's find some of the, the, the major pieces. I, I have some friends I trade equipment with. I've talked about these guys a lot. Uh, my friend Pat O'Donnell, my friend Scott Hazen. Um, wow. I mean, where do I start is the question on this one. This is, there's been stuff I've had that I wish I hadn't gotten rid of. I had a drum kit. Let me tell you a story about a drum kit. I had a good friend in high school. His name was Bill McCabe. And Bill McCabe had this white marine pearl Ludwig kit with a 24-inch bass drum, a 9x13, 10x14, 16x16 floor tom. And he had a 6, 8, 10, 12 concert tom that he bought. He bought four concert toms after I got my 8 and my 10 for my Vista Light kit. And we used to go down in his basement and play drums, and he'd come over to my house and we'd play drums. And that's how we learned records, and we learned each – he was the guy I used to, we used to work on make me smile and play Chicago tunes with and all that stuff. So basically I was at this church and I was playing this really bad, uh, Japanese kit from the sixties that I had kind of wallpapered white and taken the bottom heads off and had them tuned down like concert toms. But that was the kit I left in church. Cause I couldn't take my one kit, which was my Gretsch kit and leave it at church. So the church bought a drum kit. And the, they said, Let, we're going to buy a drum kit. So the drum kit they bought was this Ludwig drum kit of my friend Bill McCabe's, who had just bought a Gretsch kit. I helped him pick it out in New York City. So he had a maple Gretsch kit, maple colored. Um, I believe he had an 8 by 12, 9 by 13, 14 by 14. I don't think he got the 10. I think he got 12, 13, 14. 20 inch bass drum, just like mine. He, he was tired of carrying a big bass drum around. Sold me, sold the church that kit for dirt money, like five, six hundred bucks. It came with some peisty cymbals, a set of 14 inch sound edge hi hats. Okay, had like a 20 inch peisty ride, had some Cajun crashes, and all these toms and this big setup. And I played it for about six months, and then we left the church. My friend was on the board of the church, and the pastor left, a new pastor came. It's about two years later, three years later, and my friend who's on the board of the church, good friend of mine, calls me up and says, listen, the pastor's going to throw this drum kit to the curb. Do you want it? 
And I said, do I want it? I'll be there tomorrow. And I picked the drum kit up. The whole kit with all the cymbals, all the stands, the snare drum, which was a five and a half, uh, five and a half by 14 jazz festival snare drum, I believe it was, with this kit. All the toms, the cymbals, the peisty hi-hats, everything. I had all of it. And I used it for a while, but eventually I sold things off because not having a lot of money, being pretty poor, it seemed like, you know, I somehow got gear, but I didn't, I wasn't rich at this. I wasn't rich. I'm not rich now. I wasn't rich then. So I needed to sell some stuff. So one guy wanted the concert toms. I sold them. Didn't mind getting rid of them. Um, I sold the big kit, basis of the kit, to a, another guy who um, I was taking some lessons from me, and then he stopped playing drums. And he got he got that kit. I believe he got the 14-inch Sound Edge 602 hi-hats, which had a slight crack in the top cymbal, but I sure as heck wish I had those hi-hats today. I mean, those are, those, those are valuable cymbals. I also had an 18-inch Zildjian sizzle cymbal that I had in college. I bought, I bought a sizzle cymbal from a music store thinking I was buying a swish and it ended up being a sizzle cymbal with, with rivets in it. The, so I got the wrong thing is what I'm saying. But once I ordered it, I had to take it. So I took it and I brought it with me to college. And I had this 18-inch sizzle cymbal and I pulled all the rivets out of it. It was a nice sounding crash actually. And it was a decent jazz ride. And all during my time in college, guys would say, hey, you want to sell me that cymbal? For some reason, it had a big, nice bell on it. And it was bowed like kind of like a ride cymbal and had holes for rivets. But it crashed, had crashability to it. So I never sold it during college. But I had jazz guys would come up to me and say, I want this cymbal. And I just saw one the other day in a picture on Instagram. Somebody had an 18-inch sizzle cymbal with the holes, the, the way Zildjian drilled them and everything. It was factory drilled. And that went with that kit, too, to that kid. So that kid who stopped playing drums, and one day I would find it in the local drum shop. That kid I'd find in the local drum shop. Um, I sold it to him so he could do whatever he wanted with it. Um, that's one of those kits I wish I hadn't sold, and I wish I hadn't sold all that good stuff with it because that was... That was a good kit. And that crash cymbal, that crash ride sizzle cymbal, I wish I never sold that. And never got rid of the Peisty 14-inch hi-hats. Okay? Now, another part of that story is I came in, I acquired another Marine Pearl kit during that time. I don't know where I got this. I can't, my brain will not tell me where I got it from. But it had a 20-inch bass drum and an 8x12 double-headed tom and a 14x14 14 14 floor tom. So I actually had a 20-inch kick drum, a 24-inch kick drum, a 12, 13, 14, 14x14, 14 14, 16 by 16 all Marine Pearl. So I gave that drum kit to my friend Rich Sullivan, who was trying to, he wanted to buy a new kit, but he didn't have a good kit. So I said, here, take this. It's an extra, some extra drums you're taking. I gave it to him. And he sold that kit to Pat Petrillo, the guy who does all the rudimental stuff, and he's from the, new, uh, the, the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area. And Pat Petrillo bought that little Ludwig kit that I had done some stuff to, by the way. I drilled a hole in it, put a tom mount in it, and all kinds of other stuff. So, um, anyhow, I got five people left, so my stories are driving everybody crazy today. So, <laughs> thank you, Lori, for letting me know you, you sold the Premier kit and laid off at Steelworks. In 1981, that was a tough one, yeah. When you sell gear because you need to sell it, that's always a tough thing. So, any other questions out there, guys? You guys have any other questions? Um, uh, I assume you're all listening to me. But, you know, the funny thing is people listen to this at the end. They come, they they jump onto this show, like, after the show is up, you know. And I usually get about 100 people watch my shows for some reason. So, I still can't figure out why people watch me talk about drums. But that's that's another thing. I'd love to understand what the... The mystique is about it, but I know I'm a wealth of knowledge and I've been doing this a long time, but yeah, though, that's some of the gear that I wish I had not gotten rid of. That's, those are some of the tough ones. Um, I also had a 22 inch swish symbol in college Zildjian that I bought cheap that I had to sell to pay for a phone bill that I racked up on my wife's calling her collect from a phone booth in Jersey city. That's a funny story too. <laughs> I have a couple of those kind of stories. But, uh, yeah. 
Anyhow, your questions make the show, so if I don't have questions, I don't have a show. Anybody have a question, I'll give you guys a chance to wait, to ask a question because I really like to go in a different direction right now. Um, so gear I, I wish I hadn't sold, hadn't got rid of. Um, let's see. Talked about WGM. Talked about my career. Oh, boy. Anyhow. Good morning, Blake Nun Drums. Thanks for being on. Um, your questions make the show. I, I will make this a short. I'm actually in the middle of working on a cover right now. I actually, I did the I did the track last night is what I did. I did that song the night they drove old Dixie down. I don't know if that's politically correct to actually play that song. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I'm not really sure, you know, to be honest. But... I cut it last night and I mixed it this morning and I just did a version of it a few minutes at a few minutes ago. I don't think I can share that with you guys. If I did, I'd probably get this would get torn down by WGM and that would be the end of it anyhow. So I better not do that. Um, but anyhow, uh, it's funky tune, very funky. And I played it pretty out there. Funky. You know, I didn't, I did number one drums all over the place. Levon Helm is singing and drumming at the same time. That's all I can tell you. It's pretty wild what he does. Um, so, any more questions, guys? Any more questions? I'm trying to give you guys space to ask me a question. I'm kind of in that, I don't know what I want to talk about mode, you know what I mean? Uh, not the opposite, but bargains you've bought. <laughs> Lori's keeping me going. All right. And CCM drummers got one. So Lori Jones wants to know now the opposite question: bargains that I've bought. All right, you want to know some of my favorite drums bargains? Let me tell you about my Piesty cymbals. Every one of my Piesty cymbals for the last five years, other than the 24-inch Giant Beat which I bought the 24-inch Giant Beat at Guitar Center down the street. It looked more beat up than a brand new cymbal, and it's the closest I paid to the brand new price. Every one of my Piesty cymbals I have gotten an extreme discount on. Less than the going rate at the time. And the way I have done that has been I look on eBay for stores that are selling symbols I want and I'm watching to see if they're just trying to dump them they usually dump them as what they call old stock okay or they'll call it used because they can't really sell it at a lesser price because it's really not used it's brand new so my 18 inch thin giant beat which I bought used was brand new I think I got it for like 218 bucks. I think at the time it was going for closer to 300 The 20-inch Giant Beat Multi, I got that in the 220-something range at the time. It was going a little over 300 at the po that point in time. My 15-inch Giant Beat Hi-Hats, used, got them. They were brand new. I paid the much lesser than price, 100 bucks off of where the price was. The... 22 inch big beat ride same thing it had been touched though that was the one of the symbols that actually had some marks on it came from a very small um drum shop in uh boston area so it actually probably was on a rack but it wasn't as beat up as my 24 inch giant beat the 22 inch ride 2002 ride i just purchased was brand new now the way they boxed it that's another story they did a terrible job boxing it um, the 16 inch thin crash, brand new, sold as used. The 18 inch crash, 2002, brand new, sold as used. Every one of these I got a deal on. So if you know what you want and you don't have to listen to it like Pisces, you don't have to listen to Pisces. You can go listen to them one time on mysymbol.com and you'll get the gist of what the symbol's about. Their weight ranges are pretty darn close. I have gotten some incredibly great symbols, buying them as used, and they were brand stinking new. Piesties. All my Piesties symbols have been new, except for the 505 hats, which were in the family, okay? 
My, my friend Scott had them. They were my brothers originally. The the rude hi hats my wife bought brand new back in 1984. Um, the Peisty 20-inch Mark I um, prototype, uh, Dark Energy Mark I prototype, that I bought. My mother, my mother bought it for me, actually, after my dad died. She gave me some money, and I bought that symbol at Forks Drum Closet. And the last thing I bought was that Sound Edge 2000 bottom when I'm using. Um, and that symbol, by the way, I got for 100 bucks, so I got it cheap. Um, it pairs up really, really well with the bottom 505, and it sounds like the 505 um, Sound Edge hats now. Because the Sound Edge hats, the 505 hats, have about that 900 gram weight top with an 1100 gram weight bottom. A 200 grams difference and the, the the sound edge it really sounds good so that's that's my that's my bargain for you peisty symbols on ebay there's a way to shop for them um well i'm gonna take yours next because i know matthew will stick around i don't know when you're gonna fall asleep earl do you have and i will take your question matthew just just give me a minute um earl do you have time to work out on a practice pad rudiments etc or are covers enough to keep you fresh? Well, I will say that I don't practice as much as I should, okay? But I have been teaching some lessons. I have a, a student now. His name's Sean Woodley. Um, he regularly comments on things on Instagram and occasionally on YouTube. And because of Sean and, and teach some of my hand things, I do a little bit of work on the pad, but not anything like anybody else does you know what i mean um i have a tendency to work on basic first 12 things on stick control paradiddles double paradiddles triple paradiddles paradiddle diddles and i'll just sit and just warm up with that a little bit but i don't really warm up before i play a drum cover i just sit down and start playing so i i'm not a big practice guy and um i should be because i need my hands are terrible so <laughs> it should be practicing all the time but that's one of those things that i don't do enough to be honest and i wish i did um is that what the question is is that question about a practice pad uh, is that what this question is what's this thing this is my first practice pad by the way this is a um a ludwig practice pad from the 70s um actually it's not my first official one i had one that was made out of um particle board and a piece of rubber on it and then the rubber fell off that i had in uh sixth grade when i joined the drum side of band um it came with a u.s mercury pro snare drum and that was my first drum pad and then when I started to get serious about taking lessons again when I was 15, when I got a drum kit, I bought this pad. And the head's been changed one time. <clears throat> and I pulled this out the other day because my grandson um, is taking, he quasi takes lessons. I wouldn't say he takes lessons from me faithfully. So I was showing him, him some things. <laughs> and in showing him some things, I found his mom's practice pad. Um, my daughter Sandra played drums for a while in high school, and um, she can she can hold a beat. She can hold a beat if she wants to. She can she can groove, and of course she's married to a drummer. My son-in-law's a drummer, and um, my grandson is my two grandsons from them are drummers. Now one is only three, and he just bashes on stuff, but um, the older one, Asher is now playing drums and he was down here yes uh, two day two days ago and hung out for a little bit after work and i was showing him some things on the pad so he took his mom's remo pad home and we found this next to it so i pulled it out that's what this is is that what the question is matthew uh, what's that thing on the couch behind you because that's what was on the couch behind me that's a practice pad an old ludwig practice pad by the way i it's so rusted here i don't know if i'll be able to take it apart but it's got a couple little loose knobbies, and it used to be like a drum key would fit on it. You could put a drum key on it to tune it, but I don't think it's tightening down. I think the screws down here are so worn out. I haven't used it for years. Now, this is the practice pad I do play around with, and if I was doing some practicing, I would practice, you know, singles. My favorite single thing to do is
That's that's very simple, you know. Then I do, and this is what I was showing him the other day. Then you do it left-handed. And of course, you should have a metronome on too. Also helps. But um, and that's what I that's what I've been working with Sean with, like those couple things. I have a couple things I do which are single-handed exercises. Um, you do them for like five minutes long. One is with at 60 beats on the metronome, just getting power strokes in. Of course, when you're doing with a metronome at 60 and no eighth notes, it takes a lot of concentration. And the idea is to get your hand and throw it down and throw it in and let it pop back up. And so you're getting a full stroke out of it. And then you do it left-handed. You do it for five minutes. That's an exercise a friend of mine named John Favicchia showed me, which I'd like to get John Favicchia on here. He's a great teacher. Um, he's a New York player from New York City. He studied with Dom Famularo and those guys. And he and I are friends, and he lives down here, and he's been in my studio a bunch of times. And he's a guy I need to call and get him on a Zoom call or on this StreamYard one day and bring on. He is a fantastic Fusion player, check out John Favicchia on YouTube. He's only he doesn't have a lot of subscribers, but he's a great guy. Um, so I think that was Matthew's question. What's that thing on the couch behind you? Tate Berkey asked. Let's see, and I'll come back to yours, Blake. Are you gonna get Gadamant's book when it's released here soon? <laughs> you know, I am a drum. I have a ton of drum books for a guy who doesn't practice. I mean, I literally should pull out my drum books and just show you how many books I actually have. Now, the only books I really love are Realistic Rock, uh, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, and the Funk Drumming Workbook by Chet Dobo. Those are three books I studied in college, and I still to this day pull those books out. I have a Brazilian book that I use by this guy named N Nena. Nina, N-E-N-A, I think his name is excellent brazilian drummer and it's an excellent brazilian book it's actually written in portuguese i believe because i can't really understand what they're saying in there but i can see the patterns and i i mess with that once in a while but the gadamans book is definitely a book that i am thinking about picking up and the reason why is i play so many gadisms that i'd like to see his take on how he works towards it because i they're like the six stroke roll thing the paradiddle diddle that he does. Um, there's a lot of things he does that I've been doing for years that I copied, copped off of him. So it'd be nice to see how he breaks them down. So I have been thinking about picking up that book. That's one book I've been thinking about picking up. All the autographed copies, though, that he already signed have been sold, I heard. So that was I saw something about that yesterday. So um, let's see. Blake, that's super cool. You have a lot of his... <laughs> You also have a lot of history with you. Yes, I do. There's a lot of history. Let's see what this question up here was. Um, great place for gear is called Drum Flip. I've seen that. Easily about 50,000 K in symbols. Almost all half priced off. Pasty 20 there for two. That's, that's a good deal. Um, I've seen him online, Drum Flip. I just haven't bought, it, bought anything from him. Uh, my Pisces, like I was telling you, were all from de real music dealers, music shops that were dumping them. And I'll tell you what the other secret about that whole thing, that, that whole story I was telling you, was that it was the serial numbers. I realized they were selling gear that they've been holding on to for over a year. When you own a music store, if you know anything about the music store business, and I only know a little bit about it, I, I thought I was going to run one once, so I did a little research into this. You can only keep so much stock, but you have to buy so much stock to keep those product lines. And if you want Piesty, you have to buy Piesty. So the store that was selling the most of this is, I believe, is out of business or has been Chapter 11 and actually restarted. It was a store down here in M Milwaukee called Interstate Music. And Interstate Music was great for buying heads and sticks. They were the best price on the Internet, period. They were the place I would go to to buy heads and sticks. I always got 50 off. I'm never sure I'm getting 50 off anymore. And 50 off is what, when I was a kid, was pro drum price. That's what it was. If you were a pro drummer, meaning you were, you were a professional, you would get 50 off on drum heads at a good music store. Today, you rarely get 50 off. Sometimes you're getting 45, 47. 
if it's a 14 inch Remo Ambassador, you may be getting 55 off because they sell so many of them. But it used to be 50 off across the board. So the only place I would ever get 50 off across the board was Interstate Music. And they went out of business. They went out of business right around COVID coming. And Interstate Music kept their Piesty deal by dumping their Piesty inventory once a year. So usually right around Christmas time, after Christmas, first, second or third week of January, usually NAM time, I guess it was, they would start dumping used symbols. They call them used, and they were brand freaking new. They were brand new symbols. So I learned that little trick, and I started buying. That would be the time I would buy, like, February, that time. So if you need something mid-year, a lot of times it's hard to find something that's going to fall into that that range I'm talking about of being new old stock is what it really is. It's new old stock. But every once in a while you'll find a guy that does do that. So, um, let's see, 12 inch, what would Blake, you said this, I like those 12 inch Vader's double sided ones. Yeah. Mine's not double sided. I oh, know it is double sided. Hmm. <laughs> no, one had it. no, it's not double sided. This is, you can actually put it on something. Just felt double-sided for a second. It's got a little piece of rubber there. Um, good morning, Chadwick Perry, Double Deuce Drums. Nice to see you. Let's see what else we got. Um, Ed, uh, you meant Earl, I think, Blake. Uh, has or Ed is your drum flip guy. He has new stuff here. Um, here's the shop. You really are a good salesperson for him, Blake. I hope you're getting, hope you're getting some money from this guy. You should. Let's see what... Uh, my friend Chadwick has one dollar an inch for heads is what I've always thought was a good price for Remo. Yeah, that's the truth. You're not kidding about that. Now, can you get it for one dollar an inch anymore? Not anymore. I mean, even a, a six inch head is like 11 bucks now. Um, everything has gone up. I mean, I hate you've heard me talk about drumsticks. I hate to, I hate buying drumsticks. I mean, 10 bucks a pair for drumsticks is not a deal for me. I'm sorry. I I used to buy drumsticks when they were $2 a pair. You know, I used to take the drumsticks from my school band room when I was a kid. Oh, yes, I was a bad kid like that at one time. I'm a nice kid now. You guys got any more questions? I always appreciate your questions and your thoughts. Uh, your questions make the show, as you all know. Um, that's the way it works here. But um, I've told you a few of my secrets today, my secrets about buying symbols on eBay. Um, We've talked a little bit about my drum pads and my practice routine, which is really not very much. <laughs> I just don't practice enough. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, let's see. All right, Chadwick, what are you working on this week? All right. Well, last week, as you all know, I've done, I did a bunch of Roger Hawkins stuff. Um, Roger Hawkins was the famous Muscle Shoals drummer. And if those of you don't know where Muscle Shoals, Alabama is and don't know the music that was produced in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, you probably don't realize how much of that music you've listened to over your, your lifetime. And Roger Hawkins was an amazing drummer. So last weekend I did a bunch of Roger Hawkins. Um, I don't know. I may do one more, maybe one or two more of those. Um, so the videos you're going to start to see coming out are some older stuff. I still have some Roger Hawkins in the can. I, I still have some Al Jackson Jr. in the can, too. I did some Al Jackson Jr. stuff, some Stax Memphis stuff. Yesterday, I worked on, they drove Old Dixie down by um, the band, LeVon Helm. So that, that's one that I worked on so far this weekend. And I also did Diana Krall's um, Fly Me to the Moon yesterday, playing Brushes and Sticks. So... Uh, that's, that's one that will be coming out maybe sooner than later. It actually turned out pretty well. I had a lot of fun with that one. Um, my friend Andrew from the UK asked me to do a Diana crawl that do that song specifically. Um, and I needed to change a pace, but I, I'm in a change of pace mode this weekend. So I'm trying to gear up to do some eighties. That's what I'm looking at. So, um, my 80s playlist. Let's let's let me pull it up so I can give you some ideas of some of the things I'm thinking about. I, none of these are committed yet, but I do have like this Spotify playlist I look at. You know what I do? I I, I subscribe to Spotify so I can listen to whatever I want to listen to and save whatever I want to save. And 
I, I think if you're a working musician, you need to have one of these services where you can get albums quick and learn music fast. I got Spotify in 2015 when I was in this band called The Swigs, and I had to learn 80 songs. And I wasn't going to pay a dollar a song from iTunes anymore. You know, I for the longest time at church, I was paying paying on iTunes. And I realized iTunes doesn't pay the artists. So why am I paying iTunes a buck a tune? And they're making more money than anybody. So I went, I did what my son-in-law told me, get a subscription to Spotify. It was worth it. So my wife and I were on the, the double deal. They charged me every month. I used the heck out of this. This is where I get all my cover material from is Spotify. And how I get it is I record it from my board, from my Spotify on my computer, back through my board, back to Logic, and I take it. And then I cut it up, I save it as a file, then I bring it in an extract stems, and I make covers out of it. So, let me see. Future songs. This week, Fly Me to the Moon, I told you. Um, I'm looking at some songs. I'm looking at possible Roger Hawkins songs are um, When a Man Loves a Woman, Piercy Sledge. That's a really old one. I'm looking at some 80s tunes like Bang the Drum All Day by Todd Rundgren. That's, that, that's a pretty interesting one. Um, thinking of some 70s tunes, I got a couple more 70s tunes, uh, Grand Funk Railroad, possibly, I'm Your Captain, Closer to, to My Home, I, that I might do, um, and then we start getting into some 80s, 90s stuff, I got a Bonnie Raitt tune called I Can't Make You Love Me, which has got some really beautiful brushes on it, notice I'm picking songs because I want to play them, that's why I picked these songs, by the way, um, 80s tune, Black Coffee in Bed by squeeze that one I, I i always like the groove of that song for some reason um something about you level 42 is a possibility um cruel to be kind nick Lowe. that might happen um when i see you smile by bad english i'm really i'm searching for stuff i don't think wgm is going to want to take take me out on either too by the way um you get too close like i have one in here woman by john lennon which I'd really like to do that song. I mean, Andy Newmark's one of my favorite drummers in the whole wide world, and he played on that whole Double Fantasy album. And I just don't know if I'm going to get anything through. I may just be like doing Van Morrison for me. I did Van Mor- I did three Van Morrisons in the last month, and all of them got blocked. So they go into the blocked drum cover category, and that sucks. I hate wasting my time on stuff that I can't get through. But it happens once in a while. So those are some of them. Oh, yeah, that one, too. That one, too. That one, too. And that one, too. So if you can guess any of those songs, you will now know some other ones I was thinking about. One of them was Walking in Memphis, uh, Mark Cohen. That's a kind of a cool, interesting song, too. I like groove kind of songs. I like playing grooves. But the Dinah Crawl one was kind of nice, playing brushes and swinging, and that was kind of cool. All right, let's see. Blake Nunn Drum said... Let me ask a question instead. How do you go about getting the best sound for the cheapest price? Do you recycle stuff around, use old heads, muffling techniques, drum hacks? Well, I mean, I don't, my drum sounds, I don't change all that much other than I use muffling techniques more than anything else probably. But remember, I'm recording in a recording studio and I kind of know how to record drums and I can get different sounds out of just about any head. I have two kits I use for recording covers. One is a single-headed kit, which has got its own vibe and its own thing. So when I pull the Concert Tom kit out, I'm playing that kit for that sound for a reason. Um, When I play the Gretsch kit, right now the Gretsch kit's got ambassadors on it. Um, I don't change heads a lot. I usually leave them on eight, nine months usually. Um, I had clear emperors on for about nine months. Before that, I had coded emperors for a while. I've had this. I I had vintage ambassadors for a while. Um, I'm now I'm back to just ambassadors. I I love the sound of ambassadors. They sound really great. But you really got to sometimes mute things and tune them a certain way. And I change tunings. It's one of the things I'll do occasionally. Change snare drums often. But I have about four snare drums that I kind of rotate, and then I have about five, six other snare drums I could bring in. So those are all things that could happen. I'm so glad you guys are 
woken up now. You got questions for me. So I will get to those questions. But yeah, old heads. I don't, you know, I just bought one of those big fat snare drums. I'm not really impressed by it. But I used it last time in church. Last week I was in church and it actually sounded pretty cool. Um, it works on certain drums, doesn't work as well on other drums. If you've got any kind of muffling on another drum, it doesn't usually work as well. Um, but yeah, I, I changed the drum itself. That's the other thing you'll see is like, I have six toms to go with my Gretsch kit. So sometimes it'll be 10, 16. Sometimes it'll be 10, 12, 14, 10, 12, 16, 10, 13, 16, 12, 14, 16 is what I got up there right now. Sometimes it's 12, 13, 16. So I change drums around, and that's how I get different sounds, too, out of my kit. So not so much change in heads so much. That's not really my thing. My uh, Concert Tom kit right now, it's been for quite some time, 10, 13, 14, 16, and the 15 acting as the floor tom. And occasionally I throw up a 6 and an 8 next to it so I get that really wraparound thing. I can do all that Karen Carpenter stuff. But um, I don't throw away drum heads, so every once in a while I will put new different drum heads on, like the Concert Tom kit. The Concert Tom kit last year had clear ambassadors on it. Now it has clear emperors on it. And those clear emperors came off my Gretsch kit and a couple other. I bought a couple t heads, too. I bought a 15. 15 is an odd size for me. But I have 12s, 13s, 10s, 8s, 16s, and 14s all over the place because I've been playing drums 45 years. So if I was to show you all the drum heads in my studio, you would think I have a ton of drum heads. I don't really go to them many. I just keep them there as spares, and I give them to people when somebody breaks something. I they come, like a lot of guys in town will come over. Hey, can I come over? And can you fix my snare for me? And I, yeah, sure, bring it over. So that's one of the things we do. So CCM drummer, do you know who CCM artist Lenny LeBlanc is? Well, yes, I do, Matthew. Lenny LeBlanc is from Florence, Alabama, the Muscle Shoals area. I met. Lenny LeBlanc at a retreat in Florence, Alabama um, in 1999. It was a house church retreat that we went to. And I actually went to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. I flew into Muscle Shoals International Airport. <laughs> and I kid about that as a kid. as a total kid. But Muscle Shoals International Airport in 1999 was a very small little airport. It had one rental car in the place. And we got in. We flew... Northwest, so I flew to Memphis, and then I puddle puddle jumper prop plane to Muscle Shoals, and we got off the plane at Muscle Shoals, and it was one of those flights where you're like this wobbling around the whole time, and my wife, my daughter, my son, and and me got off the plane, and my son was about 15, and he was a skateboarder at the time, and. This is a great story, so I'm going to tell you the story because it's muscle, my Muscle Shoals story. Because I drove right past Muscle Shoals Sound and Jackson Highway buildings We going to the, the hospital. And I'll tell you why I had to go to the hospital. So we get off this plane at Muscle Shoals International Airport. They basically came through the gate, and my wife and daughter went to the bathroom. And are, I'm waiting at baggage, and they open up the garage door, and they throw the bags out. And that's the way it was set up in 1999. And I got the bags, and I'm bringing the bags over. I got my daughter's, my wife's bag. And my son grabs his hockey bag, and he's got his skateboard in his bag. And he pulls the skateboard out, and he takes it out to the front where Arrivals is. And there's a three-stair gap between Arrivals and the parking deck right below. And he basically does a three-stair gap thing. And I'm watching him out the window. And he tries to go for three-stair gap. And he goes for it, and he's, he's like this, and he lands, and he didn't really land it right. And I'm thinking, Matt, don't do that again. Please don't do that again. He comes back up. He goes for it a second time. And this time he's going, I'm going, Matt, no. I'm screaming. I'm looking at the window going, no, don't do it, Matt. And he goes for it. And he falls backwards, and he lands on his right arm, and he breaks his arm in two places, and his bone is sticking out. And it's bleeding. And he's going, I broke my freaking arm. And he's like this. Like, and I see his arm all twisted and stuff. And he comes into the airport. And my wife and my daughter show up. And my wife goes, what did you do? What did you let happen here? And it was really bad. And 
they just the Hertz lady just sold the last car and she said I'll take you to the hospital and she took my son and my wife to to the hospital I don't know if it was in Muscle Shoals or Florence because I it was all flying around me and I'm waiting for people to pick us up for this conference and the long and the short of it is he gets to the emergency room and they don't have an orthopedic they have one orthopedic in the county and the ortho they said we don't have this orthopedic. We're just going to wrap it up, and you can take it home on Monday when you go back to New Jersey and have them set it. This is a compound fracture. We got a bone sticking out. And my wife and I prayed. We just we got together and held hands and prayed, and the orthopedic was in the hospital. And he heard about it, and he came down, and he did emergency surgery on my son, put two plates in his arm, put the, the, the bones back together, did a wonderful job. His name was Dr. Young. Um and his practice was in Florence or whatever. I don't know, muscle, right in, the, in town. And anyhow, I remember driving past the two recording studios because I had seen pictures of Muscle Shoals sound and fame. I drove past both of them at, at, during that weekend because we were in Florence. And that's where I met Lenny LeBlanc, was at this house church conference. And we were talking. And I was so, I would have been so into seeing Lenny LeBlanc and meeting him. But. Because he wrote a couple famous songs. I we used to sing one of them. And I know I've played it a billion times, too. I can't remember the name of that song right now off the top of my head. But, yeah, I know. He's a Muscle Shoals guy. Thank you, CCM drummer, for dragging me down that memory. I'm sure you all appreciated the skateboard memory. Anyhow, that's that's the way life is. Let's see. Uh, Walton, you're still here with me. Ten bucks per pair, I wish. Australia is 25 a pair. Yeah, I know. It's it's really bad for you guys in the UK. I know. I it's 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 ridiculous. Drums. I we are spoiled. We are privileged here in the United States. I, I, I'll give it that. Um, I'm I'm a bargain hunter though, so I have so many drumsticks. It's not even funny, and I don't need more drumsticks. But there's a stick I like to play, so I buy those sticks regularly. But I don't like to pay full price, ten bucks a pair. That's for sure. Um, Let's see. Blake also asked the question, uh, how do you go about doing your editing with the green screen and putting up the cityscapes and whatnot? Oh, well, I stole that from Chadwick Perry, Double Deuce Drums, if you're still on. I stole the idea from him. He was, he's was he been doing it the longest as far as I know, but a lot of guys do it. I mean, um, Drum Covers by Bill was, has done green screens. A lot, Everybody's done green screens. A bunch of guys have done it. But the guy who did it most res- – recently and most consistently is Chadwick. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I just watched him do it and do it and do it. And one day I said, you know, I have a green screen. Why don't I try this? Well, I do it in Final Cut. It's very simple. There's there's a there's a filter called Keyer. And as long as that green screen's there and you pull Keyer in, it basically Keyer finds the green screen and then you can put another video under your video in Final Cut and it will run alongside of whatever you're doing and it lands on the green screen and it really works really well um i used that key one day i didn't have a green screen um it's in a video um new york state of mind i just released it this week if you look on the ipad i put the key on and it got on the ipad and i wanted to see what would happen if i put key in there if anything would get picked up and you'll actually see the new york um, new york skyline in a bunch of shots coming off the iPad. It's the only thing the keyer picked up. So if you're watching me play that 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 video, you'll actually look at the iPad and you'll see like it looks like a skyscraper and then you'll see like the sky and then you'll see it go to another picture. So um but it works best when you have a green screen of course and or a green screen color paper like Chadwick uses and he puts paper all over the floor that's that color. And I think keeping it flat makes it work better than the the screen mine is actually a curtain but it does work works works pretty well so um let's see spend about 200 bucks a month on sticks blake um i don't know what to say about that that's a lot of sticks you go through dude i play my sticks till it's done scary pockets never claims a tune ever i'll have to try scary pockets that's that's one of my things i'm gonna have to work on uh, don't play those streams, get them pulled. Be careful, man. Interesting, right? Was that Scary Pockets you were talking about, Chadwick? Not sh- not sure. Let's see. All right. Let's find some things. I must have missed a few. Um, 
Got that. I got that one. Um, did I hear in the air tonight? That's a great question. I heard that song about 1980, 81, when Phil Collins did it the first time. I'm that old. <laughs> I've been listening to that song forever. <laughs> Love that song, Blake. I'm going to have to do that, though. That's one I should probably do. I have those concert times, right? There's a reason I haven't done it. Let me tell you why. Because I'd have to get it perfect, and I'd have to do it exact, and that would make Matthew Jackson very happy. But I don't. you, you guys know I don't like playing exact. It's too much work for me sometimes. Even though I get darn close some days. Um, would love to see you do Walking in Memphis. All right, Bill. I'll put that on the list for this weekend. It is one of those songs I really enjoy doing, so I will try to do that one. Um, Lake Nine Drums. Yep. Talking signature sticks. Yeah, signature sticks are always going to cost more no matter where you're at. There's no doubt about it. Um, which BFH did you get? The weight, full circle, or the dot cutout? Oh, good good question. Big fat snare drum. Um, mine's the full one, and I don't think I like it. I think I should have got the cut, the one cut in the middle. The I I just don't like it being over the whole drum. But I think the bigger, fatter cut. I actually made one of those once. Um, I had a ten by fourteen Yamaha marching snare drum that I sold this year because the the kid who comes down and plays in my studio with my son-in-law. Um, He's a great drummer. His name's Ian Jones. And um, he fell in love with that stupid snare drum. And I didn't spend any money for that drum, by the way. I spent $40 on that snare drum. It was all broken, though. It was The snares were broken. The heads were broken. I was missing two lugs. Bought it for 40 bucks. Found a couple lugs. Put it on. Um, put new snares on the bottom. 42-strand snares. Put a new strainer on it. Um, changed the heads. And just start playing it. It looked really beat up. It had that Yamaha look, it, like the mahogany shelled stage series from the eighties. And I put this big Evans head that I cut a hole in. No, it was an Aquarian head that I cut a hole in it. And I dropped it on there, and I would only use it for that sound. It had that big splap and sound. And he loved the drum, and he kept kept asking me, "Will you, will you sell the drum to me?" So I have an eight by fourteen brass. Um, Black Magic, and I said, yeah, sure. I sold it. He goes, but I said, what will you give me for it? And he goes, 150. I said, okay, I'll, I'll sell it to you for 150. I didn't want to take them for like to the cleaners kind of thing, but I also didn't want to just sell it for 40 bucks because I put money into it to fix it up a little bit, you know. So, but that's where I had that head on, and ever since I got rid, I can make these heads. They're not hard to make these big fat snare drum things. You just take an old head, cut it, and then cut the middle out. Doesn't take much to do it, but I bought one, spent the twenty bucks, and wasn't really wasn't as the big fat head. That's what that's exactly it. All right, let's see. Blake Nunn, I agree that the big fat cover snare covers. They're also that specific rock sound for zero overtones. Yeah, it is a rock sound, but you can get that sound by taking tape over your drum heads or taking some paper towels and tape or moon gel if you put a lot of moon gels on your heads. They, there's lots of ways to get that sound, um, but that's one way to do it. It's quick and easy and painless. Um, sure, I gotta play, gotta got you play signatures too. Mostly Steve Jordan's. When you start getting into signature sticks, you're gonna pay more money for them. So the only time I buy signature sticks is usually when I buy them from at, at a store that when they're on sale. Like the last time I bought Steve Gad sticks, and I love the Steve Gad stick by the way. That was a stick I used to play in, co in college and when I got out of college because they were making that stick in the 80s at a drum shop in New York. Modern drum shop used to make a Steve Gadd copy. And they had a pair of his Yamaha black sticks. And Steve's first drum sticks that were made for him were made by Yamaha. When he got his Yamaha endorsement, Yamaha made him drum sticks. And they were exactly like the Vic Firths, by the way. And they were black. And... The drum shop in New York, modern drum shop in the early 80s, had those sticks, but they weren't black. But when you went in there and I, I said, you know, I'm looking for something with a little ball on it, you know, because I used to play a Rogers 2C. It had a little ball on it. And Rogers was out of business now. And they said, well, listen, we've got this Steve Gadd stick. I said, well, let me let me try it. And I played it. It was, wasn't real heavy. It's, it was a little shorter than 16 inches. 
and I'm playing it, and he goes, listen, they, it's the Steve Guest stick. I have a pair of his sticks, and he pulled a pair of the black sticks, the Yamaha sticks off the, the shelf and said, here, play it. Just feel how they're the same. And that's how he sold these sticks, by the way. <laughs> Just, wow, I'll, I'll take a couple pairs of them. So I was buying those for like three bucks a pair in 1980. So when Gad went to Vic Firth, I used to buy his sticks. I used to buy Weckl sticks, too, for years. Then I started buying B- Vader Fusions. And then the last time I bought Gad sticks, it was at Guitar Center, and they were on sale for like 7 bucks a pair. And I said, well, today's the day to buy five pairs of Gad sticks, and I did, bought them. And then a couple years ago, I bought some second-run sticks with a little small bead, and they ended up being the Gad stick. And I think they were Vic Seconds. The Guitar Center had them in a bo- in a bundle, and half of them were useless, and half of them were good. And I weighed them; they were exactly like the Gad stick. I have a couple pairs in my bag. I would pull them out, and I actually weighed them and put little dots on the ends of them to remind me remind me that they were the proper weight; they, they were the heavier weight because the lighter weighted ones sounded terrible. But they were they were somewhere between forty one grams and sixty grams, and anything in the high fifty gram weight, I was using and i would give the other ones away to kids you know kids i was teaching lessons to at one point and my grandkids blah 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 all right let's see if we got any more questions here um tate berkey i made two big fat snare drums from old heads that's the way to go man always seems like the snare has to be tuned right to sound good that is the other it's part of it is the snare being tuned right too i think you're right um brian Hey, thanks for being on the show today, Brian. Glad, glad to have you today. Um, let's see if I got anything else. When you play six hours a day every day supplying drumsticks, 30 different students, you're going to go through a lot of sticks. You know, no doubt about it. And if you were to look at my drumsticks, my box of drumsticks, you see I go through a lot of sticks, even playing three days a weekend, you know, pretty much. But I don't know. I tend to beat them till into submission. That's my thing. I don't know. Blake Nunn. Let's see. What's going on? Brian. Okay. It's about Brian. All right. Any more questions? You guys got any more questions? I'm an hour and 17 in. I still got eight people on. Um, thank you, Brian. Love my red label 2002. So do I. By the way, I'm really digging the ride cymbal. It's a little heavier than I've been playing, but that ride cymbal really just cuts through. I had a 22 ride. I'm I dig it. Um, I just did a cover, Diana Crawl, where I've got the 22, 2002, and I got the Big Beat 2002 right next to one another. I play both of them in the, in the song. And the 22 Big Beat is darker. So that's I think that's why I originally liked about it was darker. But I'm starting to grow to like the brighter 2002 sound. So anyhow, it's kind of cool. Um, what did Tate say? I mainly use... Mine at a gig switched. Yeah, that's that's what that's what they're for. If you want to change snare drums really quick in a gig, big fat snare drum works, no doubt about it. Um, let's see this one. Do you have yoga today? <laughs> yes, I do. At eleven o'clock, I will be out of here by eleven o'clock. Um, Two thousand two rides are unbelievable. I reg- regret getting rid of one of those back in the day. Yep depends on the ones too the, the rides just the rides are kind of uh incredible no doubt about it so um anyhow your questions make the show if you guys got any more questions i'll ha- happily go down a rabbit hole for you uh i can't believe how many rabbit holes i went down today and i do appreciate all of you being on the show and dropping in and asking questions and saying hi that's what makes this show fun uh you really make the show you know what i mean and if I don't have questions, there's really not much of a show. It's just me talking crazy stuff. So uh, let's see what the new comments are. I got one. All right. Um, let's see. Chadwick, when you use Sabian, did you have to use nylon tips to add the brightness? Uh, you know, I've never been a big nylon tip guy. Matter of fact, I only have two pairs of nylon tip sticks in all my three stick bags I've got. So... No, I never used nylon. I, I was going for the dark thing. When I was playing Sabians, my Sabian HHs, I was going for the dark thing. Matter of fact, I thought that's what I wanted, was darker was better. And I mean, I went from college 
till 2015 where the dark thing is what I was going for. And that's why the Pisces didn't really find their way into my life until 2015. I mean, I always had a couple and I always dug, I always dug my rude hi-hats, but they're kind of dark. They're not, they're not as bright as you think the rude ones. And I used them for years until 1991 when I bought my, um, 13 inch Sabian HH, uh, Sabian AA regular hats. And I had the 19 inch HH heavy, medium, heavy ride, the 18 inch crash ride sound control and my 17 inch thin crash. And then I had my 13 inch hi hats. I used those for a long time with a Piesty signature China. That was the only thing I would use the Piesty for was the China. And I used that signature China with those Sabians for years. I mean, 20 years, pretty much. Those were the symbols. I bought a couple AAXs, which were plenty bright enough. So when I needed the bright thing, I went to the AAX crashes, a 14-inch studio crash, 15-inch studio crash. I eventually bought a 19-inch AAX studio crash. I still have that in the 15. Uh, I gave the 14 away a long time ago. Um, and then I had some splash symbols, 10-inch AA, 8-inch AA, and then I had an AAX um, eight inch for a while. And I also had or 10 inch for a while. And then I had a seven inch, uh, evolution HHX. And then I had a couple other Sabians. I have a 20 inch medium ride from the eighties HH, but I was going for dark. I kept wanting dark, the darker, the better. And then I found the Carope and it was like really, really dark. And I was playing wood tip sticks. Like I felt like you're going to play dark. You got to play wood tip because wood tip gives you that really dark thing. You know what I mean? Jeff Holden, nice to have you on today, Jeff. I see the music room's on. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Got to have you on this show one of these days, Jeff Holden. That's one of my goals in life is to bring you on like you did for me a long time ago. Uh, we'll have to figure that out one of these days. Hope all is well. Um, but anyhow, I went Piesty in 2015. And I bought the Giant Beat ride. I already had a Dark Energy, but then again, that's dark. So, no, I didn't use nylon tips to brighten it up. I just started buying brighter symbols. And the Pisces don't really need nylon tips. Pisces sound great the way they are. So, um, Brian Curry says, I've been getting symbols that have that low hum sound, not digging it. I think Zildjian isn't what they used to be. It's a possibility, Brian. I don't want to comment about Zildjian. I think Zildjian makes some great lines of symbols, but... I don't know what symbols are going after right now. I think that the strange, dark, weird stuff is selling big time. So if you're into like really normal sounding symbols, you got to go looking in other lines somewhere. Um, if you're a Zildjian guy, I'd be looking at the Avidus line or the Armand line. Matter of fact, the Armand symbols are really beautiful symbols, and they started cutting back on making those. Um, my friend Michael uh, Mike Frizzano gave me an, an Armand 19-inch r- ride, the beautiful baby ride. That's that thing is beautiful. I need to get another Armand ride symbol or an Avidus to make my Zildjian thing work. So, because I got the Crope hi hats, I got the 22-inch Crope is too dark for everything. It's great for jazz though. It's a great jazz symbol. Um, did you use same? Yeah, I have Sabian hi hats. I got some 13-inch. I also had a set of. This is a set. This is going back to the, one of the questions you guys asked me. Symbols you, re, things you regret getting rid of. I got a set of KZ hi hats from the '90s. Um, right now, my son-in-law has them. <laughs> okay, I gave it to him. Um, I traded with my friend Ken Burton my 14-inch hand hammered duo hats, which were so dark, but they were so good. I mean, they were so good dark. That kind of washy dark thing. And I love those symbols. But when he came in with the KZs one day, I said, well, he goes, I only want Sabians. He He's funny. He likes only wants Ludwig to trade. He only wants Sabians to trade. He did not want to trade me anything else. So I was like, okay, well, all right, I'll trade you these. But don't, you know, don't get rid of them. You know, it's, that's when we trade, I, there's always an assumption like, don't get rid of them because if you really don't like them, maybe we can trade back. You know, we can make that happen. So I gave them to him. He sold them immediately on eBay. And I hated those KZ hats after that. I just hated them. I really do hate those hats. 
So I have a set of 90s KZs that I hate, 13-inch. And he sold off my duo hats, which I did like. And they were custom-ordered for me by my friend who was a Sabian endorser. So I got a good deal on them, too. So, choo! But I like Sabian hats. They were nice. They were, they were cool. Um, I'm still looking for a set of 14-inch Sabian hats to go with my Sabian setup one of these days. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, six hours a day. I know you practice a lot. No doubt about it, Blake. Um, okay. I think it's cool you give sticks away to your students. Yeah, I have given sticks away to my students. No doubt about it. All right. Been busy. We are wide open up here. I've been digging a ton. So, Jeff, you, I know. I, I assumed you've been busy. Um, that's great that you guys are wide open there and you're working again. I'm, so that's great that you're gigging too. I mean, if that's happening for you, that's awesome. I'm glad to get you back to work. And I know it was a tough year last year. I, last, last year was a bad year for a lot of people. I, I was so blessed to work for a company where I could work from home. I've been working from home from day one with this company. Um, this was the company that I went to during my transition when I started doing YouTube covers. And I've been so blessed to be at home and be able to work from home. So um, I felt so much pain for all you guys that have lost gigs. I have so many musician friends that had no work last year. I don't even know what to say about that. I feel for you, Jeff. So I'm glad you're gigging. That's awesome. Um, kiddos are poor. So you see happy kiddos when they get a fresh pair of sticks. Definitely. Kids are poor. No doubt about it. Let's see what else we got. Um, thank you, Drum Covers. Like Bill, have a revolving door, many students. Lots of sticks. Yeah, I guess so. But you should be selling some sticks to those guys. You would need them to make some more money there. Um, oh, Brian says, you should have gave me those K KZs. Yeah, give them to you? No, no. You have to trade. I trade with people. You come up with a trade, I will trade with you, Brian. That's the way it works. All right, and I know Blake teaches. Anything else? You guys got any more questions? You guys hit me on some really good stuff today. Um, your questions make the show. Um, yeah, the KZs are, they are worth something. They're actually, guys really want those KZs for some reason. I don't know why, but guys want those KZs. So if, they're, if I can find a guy that wants those KZs and has something I want, then we'll be able to get rid of them. But until then, my son-in-law has them, and I took back my 13-inch Pisces that I gave him. I have a set of 13-inch Pisces um, dimensions, light heavies, the kind that Bruford used. So um, I don't play them very often, though. I still, I am really digging my 2000 Sound Edge bottom with my 505 bottom top. It's working great on my covers right now. So uh, let's see what Blake has to say. Have a third of the venues that have reopened, the rest closed for good, but the same amount of musicians. So we're all after less spots. Yeah, I think things are opening up here in West Palm too now, finally. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. It's going to be interesting to see the big venues open up and how that works. Especially with the, the craziness about the vaccine that's out there. Really don't want to get too deep on that one because that's... That's a whole other topic right there that I stay out of. I'm not going to get political about anything right now. I'm about drums. Drumming is what I'm about. I appreciate you all being on the show with me today. I mean, this has been fun hanging out with you all. Um, an hour and a half, I think, is long enough for you guys. Thank you so much for all watching. Thank you for dropping in, my friends that dropped in. Jeff Holden, let's catch up on uh, Facebook Messenger one of these days. And... Um, Definitely be something I want to do. Tate, thanks for being on. I appreciate you've been listening to me while you're packing up for tonight's gig. Have a great gig. Jeff, have a great gig. Um, Blake and Brian, enjoy your drum lessons. Have fun today, this weekend. Um, you guys are all great. Thanks for watching my covers, but more importantly, thanks for being friends here on YouTube. Everybody, thank you, and I will talk to you again most likely next week. See you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.